On the 14th of June, in the early hours of that Wednesday morning, I received a phone call that would not only change my life, but the lives of many others. It was a hot day during Ramadan, so I'd been fasting. So it was particularly a long day. I remember being exhausted. I'd gone to bed. I think I must have just dozed off. When I was awakened by my husband shouting from downstairs, Fatima, he was shouting, there's a fire in Grenfell. I think I heard the word fire. As you do, grabbed the phone, leaped out of bed, and ran downstairs, where he started to explain that a friend of his, who had lived nearby, had called him and said that the tower was on fire. As he was explaining, he was rushing to the front door. Where are you going? I said, wait for me, I'll come with you. No, he said, I'm sure it'll be fine. Let me just go and see what the situation is. At that point, my phone was ringing. I looked at my phone, and it was my granddaughter, Nyla. I think at this point, I was shaking with fear and panic. I picked up the phone to hear my granddaughter scream, Mwima, Mwima, there's a fire in our block. We're stuck. My mum's crying, and we're scared. For a moment there, I didn't quite know what to say. All I know is the utter feeling of fear and panic. I tried not to let Nyla hear that in my voice. So I tried to reassure her. And I said, don't worry, darling, I'm sure you'll be fine. Let's just see what's going to happen. Let's just, what's happening? I could clearly hear my daughter-in-law, Rabia, in the background. I asked Nyla, who's your mum talking to? To the fire brigade, she said. They're telling us there's a fire somewhere in the tower, but they're telling us to stay here and that they'll come back for us. I was reassured by this and said, well, that's what you must do, Nyla. Be brave and wait, and they will come back for you. I think the conversation proceeded a few more minutes when I could clearly hear lots of talking in the background, and all of a sudden, Nyla again screamed, Mwima, Mwima, I can see the fire outside our kitchen window. They're not coming back for us. I could also hear my, my daughter-in-law, Rabbi, in the background shouting someone, there's too much smoke, it's too dark in the corridor. There's no way I can use the staircase. I have three young children. Now, at this point, the fear and the panic had taken hold. And I can't remember what I was saying, but I think for a few minutes, I was just trying to reassure them. And then eventually, my daughter-in-law, Rabia, decided to evacuate her flat on the 18th floor and make that perilous journey down the stairs with three young children. At this point, all contact was lost, so we kept feeling the worse. I couldn't remember what I was saying or doing at this point, but the scenes outside the blazing tower were of absolute horror and desperation. People were everywhere, people crying, sobbing, watching helplessly. Some people passed, up, passed out screaming, shouting, please help them, help them. Tensions were high. Many people wanted to go inside the tower to help rescue people. And they were angry with the, with the emergency services for not allowing them into the tower. We heard pleads of, please let us go up, please let us help you. Ambulances, police cars, fire engines, blue lights, horrifying screams, smoke and despair filled the air that night. But all I could hear was the deafening silence of my grandchildren and their mother as they disappeared down the stairwell. I couldn't help but think the worst, and I was absolutely convinced that they weren't going to make it. This, for me, was the darkest moment in my life. I felt they can't make it. How can they? The tower was alight. And what seemed like an eternity they emerged from the tower. Children carried by firefighters, their mother being aided, blackened with smoke, coughing, gasping, but they were alive. And I just remember the absolute relief and joy of just seeing them emerge from that burning tower. They were rushed into ambulances. My daughter-in-law, Rabia, and the two of the children later collapsed and had to be put in an induced coma due to toxic smoke inhalation. 
cyanide poisoning and injuries. But they were alive and it was a miracle. And I kept saying it was a miracle. And I remember praying and thanking God for saving them. But sadly, that miracle wasn't the same for everyone else. Many people didn't get to see their families emerge from the tower. 72 people lost their lives. 72 people, including men, women, babies, both born and unborn, children, and young people, all perished in the worst fire, worst residential fire in the UK since the Second World War. That's 72 people, 72 lives, 72 families, 72 futures and 72 happinesses and birthdays and weddings. That's the equivalent of the first 10 rows of this arena. Can I ask that we all please take a moment to reflect on them and to reflect on that? Thank you. Now, as many of you may know, the tower is situated in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea, one of the wealthiest boroughs in the country, containing some of the most expensive houses in the world, and with the largest gap between rich and poor anywhere in the country. But it also has one of the most diverse populations in the UK. The first few days after the fire were so difficult to deal with because the response was so chaotic. It was pandemonium, it was chaos. People were angry, they were hurt, searching for their loved ones, trying to get information about the whereabouts. The world's media was there with constant coverage. We watched as families went from one emergency center to another, from one hospital to another, trying to find out where, the whereabouts of their loved ones. Many people didn't have anywhere to go. Others just wanted to stay there and comfort each other and try to make sense of what had just gone on. I think it was a week or so after the fire when I was at the children's hospital bedside when I received a phone call from a colleague that I had worked with in a large NHS uh, trust. He had asked me if I would consider coming back to help with the response effort. I felt, well, I could either stay, take a step back and take care of my own family, or I could go and offer whatever resource and support that I had in the response effort and to reach out to the community. And at the end of July, when the children and their mother were discharged from hospital, I did just that. I returned to the old, my old employer, the NHS Trust, and tried to make sense for myself and for the rest of the community of all the chaos that had ha actually been born out of this tragedy. Now, one of the things that this fire has highlighted and which predates the tragedy is that the lack of, there's a, the, the lack of connection between the local authority, statutory service, including the NHS, and the local community. I've witnessed firsthand and experienced in my 10 years of working for a trust of what, what seemed to me like an almost contemptuous view of the population that made up North Kensington. I had seen it over the years push more and more back to what is now known as the Grenfell area. They even built a secondary school at the foot of the tower. I was also painfully aware that the mental health delivery model that was actually being offered in response to this tragedy was probably not going to work. I had, again, experienced working 10 years in that community and struggled to deliver a mainstream mental health provision to a population that had different needs and to a local population that probably didn't trust it and sometimes didn't want it. So I viewed myself as someone with a lived experience of both being a service user and a service provider. And I felt I could use that experience and put it to good use. So one of the first things that we did is that I brokered a meeting between the local authority, the NHS, and representatives of bereaved and survivors, Grenfell United, 
key decision makers were asked to sit around the table with devastated people that had lost and suffered so much. I saw my colleagues moved by what they heard. I saw them create really good opportunities to build bridges and to make some real human connections. And an example of this came when bereaved and survivors wanted to revisit the tower. And I remember there being many, many concerns about this request. Bereaved and survivors wanted to go back up to the tower to either visit where their loved ones had lived and died. Some people wanted to retrieve their belongings. Others just wanted to pay their respect. But the systems that were around them found it difficult to negotiate that and to make that happen. But bereaved and survivors pushed and Grenfell United pushed until finally systems got together, they came together, spoke together, and made a concerted effort on the ground, and they made these visits happen. Over 200 visits were made to the tower. Families felt contained, they felt reassured, and they appreciated the fact that although people had many concerns, they came together to support them. Colleagues of mine, psychologists and therapists, felt really privileged to be able to assist their clients not to do talk therapy or CBT or EMDR, but just to simply be human beings and walk alongside their clients and just to witness and to observe. Systems don't always encourage people to use their authentic voice and position. It takes people with real courage and vision to do that. And I've been incredibly lucky to work with some really good people that have done just that. They've stepped out of their system speak and they've made real things happen for people. Now, one of the other tragedies, again, as it's unearthed that for so many people in North Kensington have felt silenced and ignored for so many years. And what this tragedy has done, it's highlighted and shone a light on this magnificent community where they feel now that they have found their voice and a strong, powerful voice, and they are demanding to be heard. Over the past few months, ordinary people have been put into extraordinary positions. Grenfell United, representative bereaved and survivors, have worked tirelessly to bring the community together to bridge the gap between local authority, local government, and, nas and, and national government. They have marched silently with the wider community for justice. They have lobbied, and they have made real efforts to try and bring people together and to have real human conversations. As one Grenfell United member said, the shrouded, burnt-out tower reminds us that Grenfell wasn't just a tragedy, it was a preventable tragedy. But the one thing that it does teach us is that when we come together as a community and use our collective strong voice, we can, we can achieve unimaginable things. Now, there's still a lot of work to do in North Kensington. The community is still traumatized, they're still angry, they're still seeking justice. But I've seen that there are real opportunities real possibilities for a hopeful legacy. Now, my grandchildren had to fight and use all their might to escape the tower that night. Their courage and determination is what inspires me to get up every morning and join the fight for change. It's very sad that it's taken 72 lives being lost to make those, create those changes and to make those conversations happen. And one thing that I pray for and hope for is that we learn, and we learn together. We come together. I don't want my grandchildren growing up being defined as victims of Grenfell, nor do I want them to grow up thinking that the fire happened because human beings didn't care about each other. I want for them very much a hopeful legacy. I want them to grow up in a community that is positive and strong. And so in my journey, I've learned that when human beings connect together as real human beings, we can achieve unimaginable things. So I'm going to leave you with three things that I've learned in my journey so far. To the system, to air is human, 
We, the community, know that and understand. But be authentic enough to acknowledge it. To the community, find your voice together. Find a collective, a shared narrative. Change can happen and will happen, but it can only happen when we work together from the grassroots. And to everyone else, the own trust and compassion are the only currency that transcends everything. So invest in it, build it, and harvest it. Nothing generates more return on that investment. Thank you for allowing me to share my journey with you. Yeah.